garden greetings and a warm New Year's welcome to everyone visiting our small space and, in this video, our secret place for the January 2024 garden tour. Our January garden is a place of restful muted colours, the subtle winter palette contrasting with the richness and vibrancy of animated summer scenes. I find it totally enchanting in its own understated way, engaging our appreciation for the beauty of evergreen foliage and for the range of gorgeous hues in nature's green colour spectrum, which inspired the name of our channel, the freshness of apple greens. The lushness of pea greens. The mysterious magic of fern greens. And blue tinged tranquility of sea greens. Apple P. Fern C. Seed heads hold memories of summer past, while buds swell with the promise of flower filled seasons waiting for us. The green touch paper of spring bulb shoots fires us up with a keen sense of anticipation for late winter and early spring colour to follow. Hellebore buds seem to unfold their very hearts to the world. As if, like us, they are embracing the welcome lengthening of winter daylight hours. Each day, like a segmented fan, opening just a little further every time, courtyard or small size garden, every square inch of planting space is precious and for us this includes our secret garden along the paved passageway at the side of the house. We've never included this in our videos before but it does have the most charm in winter so we hope you enjoy a mini tour. The container-grown bamboo grove creates vertical accentuation, softening the impression of internal compression between the six-foot fence panels and the brick wall of the house. In an area we also use to store the long tom pots for summer annuals. Bamboo creates a sense of privacy and shelter and beautiful shadows playing on the walls. Bamboos underplanted with hardy evergreen perennials, including ferns transplanted from the main garden where spores germinate in the dampest area of the lawn, and one of my favourite low maintenance, elegant shade loving evergreens that thrives in containers, sweet box, its tiny flowers responding to the gentle warmth of human breath 
heating the petals to entice the release of their delightful winter fragrance on chilly mornings. Flowers are followed by berries. We use root barriers within pots to protect smaller plants like hellebores from vigorous bamboo invasion. Along paving cracks at the base of larger containers, violets have self-seeded and we appreciate the way these soften hard landscaping, adding a slightly wild round the edges feel, along with cyclamen and the odd flowering campanula defying the winter season. But hellebores are the stars of the moment. Hellebore cinnamon snow is an evergreen with glowing creamy white petals that are wonderful for illuminating shady spaces under deciduous trees and shrubs or where buildings block sun for much of the day. Petals age with a pink flush. The large petals are actually petaloid sepals. The cinnamon coloured stems are a really attractive feature too. This plant prefers moist, neutral to alkaline soil and will cope with heavy soil as long as it's not waterlogged. It also grows happily in containers. A more icy white bloom with generously sized sepals is Helleborus niger, also known as the Christmas rose. Another moisture lover like cinnamon snow, this variety needs really good drainage to emulate the mountain slopes it originates from in southern and central Europe. So it's best to add lots of organic matter to its planting hole or container. Alkaline to neutral soil is recommended. It's happy in semi-shade and any direct sun seems best coming in the morning. This cultivar is winter gold, which usually has six sepals whereas other hellebores have five. Sepals may take on a green, pink or russety tint over time, possibly to increase photosynthesis. Like many hellebores, it appears to collapse in a harsh winter freeze, but quickly draws itself up again as temperatures rise. With year-round interest, its large palmate leaves look almost like tropical foliage in summer. For areas of dry shade, one option would be pretty and pleasing pirouette, which is a hybrid between Helleborus niger and sternii, which is itself a Mediterranean hybrid between the Majorcan and Corsican hellebores. Like the forebears in its Mediterranean ancestral lineage, pirouette will need to be kept moist until established, but as it matures, it becomes tolerant of dry conditions, preferring neutral to alkaline soil. Pirouette produces a great abundance of blooms from winter into spring. Like all hellebores, it's also a valuable nectar and pollen source for the earliest emerging pollinators. The Oribe Stone Lantern is, to my regret, not displayed to best effect in this slightly crowded space. It was originally destined for another area of the garden, but that project, like so many things we all plan in a parallel mind universe where there are fewer time demands on us, has yet to evolve. And meanwhile, we've become attached to its presence here, in close view of the house. This style of lantern is believed to have been created by renowned tea master Furuta Oribe in 16th century Japan, 
a warlord who relinquished his military leadership to become an iconic force in cultural pursuits. This style of lantern continues to be used today in Japan to light the Tsukubai wash basin for ritual cleansing before the tea ceremony takes place. On our lantern, the original platform that supports the Hibukura or firebox was missing when we acquired it. So the curved paving stone we substituted is not authentic, but does play to the concept of wabi-sabi, which is the appreciation of beauty in imperfection, impermanence or the incomplete. Furuta Oribe did not just appreciate naturally occurring imperfection, he was actively breaking and reassembling objects to redefine the components of beauty and the way his disciples experienced the objects and art they encountered. A contemporary commented rather disapprovingly, This man destroys treasures, he trims a scroll to improve its shape, and he breaks an unblemished tea bowl or tea caddy and then repairs it to make it more amusing. As with his military achievements, Oribe embodied a thoughtful yet fearless sense of artistry. don't know if this idea will fly, but I've been trying to think of historical figures known for the objects enjoyed in gardens today, in the same way that Furuta Oribe is associated with a stone lantern design that is over 400 years old. And the magnificent gardens at the Palace of Versailles were the first place to come to mind. Orange tree boxes with finials at each corner, known as Versailles planters, were an ingenious and practical invention. Conceived here during the 17th century under King Louis XIV, the Sun King, by landscape architect and principal gardener, André Le Nôtre. The sturdy oak and cast iron design for the orangery, where trees were coaxed to fruit throughout the year, allowed for all four walls of the container to be removed so that soil could be replaced and the health of the root system monitored. Today, the original removable side style is apparently patented, but Versailles-influenced planters continue to be very desirable in both opulent and less palatial residences alike. The next style icons springing to mind are elegant benches particularly associated with Sissinghurst Castle in Kent, South East England. The Lutyens benches were originally designed in 1913 by architect Edwin Lutyens for a private arts and crafts style residence called Little Fakeham across the county border in West Sussex. At Sissinghurst Castle, visitors can rest and soak up the surroundings on a Lutyens bench in the world-famous White Garden. At the top of the moat walk, there is a particularly popular style found in gardens around the globe and appreciated for its elegant balance of angular and curved geometry. This iconic outdoor seating also overlooks the rose garden and because of this association, is often known as the Sissinghurst Bench.
Its pleasing silhouette befits any grand house, but seems perfectly suited to a small sized garden or courtyard too, as found here at Apple Pea Fern Sea. Luchin's bench designs are over a hundred years old, another increasingly popular garden icon with a truly historic provenance is the image of the green man. Foliate heads like this sculpture at Antony House in Cornwall have origins in ancient Roman and Mesopotamian architecture, as well as appearing in churches across Europe since the Middle Ages and that other British place of worship, the pub on signs since the 17th century, but their use in garden art and sculpture is a more recent phenomenon. Today, this icon of old English ritual has varied appearances, interpretations and associations across different groups, but is often linked with renewal and fertility. I think for many garden visitors today, the green man is a potently stirring and poignant symbol representing our connection with nature and the way we are bound to the earth and every living thing, the way the natural world governs our lives, even though our everyday modern existence may mean we have never felt more alienated from it. And more than that, many people articulate a sense of judgment in the face of a green man, as if he is watching our actions and we had better make good our respect and care for nature. We filmed these sculptures in August along the Wildwood Trail at Wakehurst Botanic Gardens, deep in the heart of Sussex, where handwoven creations in natural materials around the woodland lend a magical element to wilder surroundings. It is very charming and feels rather like walking through a storybook filled with favourite childhood animal characters. These are also exquisitely skillful works of art. This year we plan to expand our container-grown, long-season flowering, pollinator-pleasing salvia collection. We currently grow Cerro Potosi, a marvellous magenta with long-distance impact beloved by bees. And the intriguing salvia your feet walk you straight over to, blue suede shoes. Hot pink perfection is pink pong, flowering on and on and on. Salvia Josh has the pleasing contrast of fiery flowers and pear green leaves. Salvia Armistad grows huge and handsome with resplendently rich tones. He is a very courageous plant and while not fully hardy, has still tried to flower this January. We've always admired tall and delightfully pretty Phyllis Fancy, filmed here looking very floriferous and fabulous in late October at Sissinghurst Castle and Great Comp Garden in Kent. 
So we're looking forward to adding Phyllis to our Salvia family this year. But one Salvia we have lots of, more than any other in the garden, is Rosemary, which has for a while now been officially reclassified as a Salvia, scientifically backed by DNA testing. And there's another favourite plant in our garden that has been reclassified relatively recently. Our sedums are now officially Hylotelephium. But when will we remember to stop instinctively calling them sedums? Thinking about these name changes made me reflect on the way our smartphone visual algorithms classify images of plants by physical attributes. So, for example, if I enter the term daffodil into my iPhone photo search facility, I get lots of my past photos and films of daffodils, but also white irises, yellow irises, orchids, yellow poppies, yellow dahlias, yellow lilies, and helenium, amongst others. And out of curiosity, when I type in elephant, the iPhoto image algorithm provides grazing cattle. Kind of comforting in a way, in that I still feel a bit smarter, or at least a bit more visually nuanced than my technology. And this also serves as a reminder that botanical reclassification of plants is an important human algorithm upgrade, because otherwise, metaphorically speaking, we might be calling a cow an elephant. We're sending out heartfelt appreciation and our best wishes to everyone scattered around the globe who comes together here to subscribe, engage with and support us at Apple P. Vern C. Thank you. Et merci. We hope you'll join us throughout the year to come and we wish you one and all flowerful times and nature-soothed minds. <laughs>